and I'm going to turn our attention to our speaker today. Um, we're really happy to have Angela Rusher with us. Um, in addition to many things, she's also local. She's a, a professor and a doctor of physical therapy program at Samuel Merritt in Oakland. Um, she's the course coordinator for the Neurologic Patient and Client Management Series, and she helps uh, PT students learn how to work with people who have Parkinson's disease and other neurologic conditions. So this includes supporting students in their community participant lab, which she's going to talk to us about in a little bit. Um, so Dr. Rusher holds a doctorate in physical therapy and is board certified um, in neuro neurologic clinical specialties. Um, she earned her PhD also in education and leadership from Pacific University in Oregon um, with research exploring PT informed neurologic health promotion and wellness programs. Um, she's also a Parkinson's wellness recovery trained clinician and prior to leaving Kaiser, to go into academia, she helped with the development of the PD programming throughout the Kaisers in Walnut Creek, Antioch, and Dublin. So as you can see, she's well, very well qualified to give this talk, and we're thrilled to have her. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Rusher. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Monique, for that lovely introduction. And it's um, nice to see some familiar faces, actually, in the audience here. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk and I will do my best to keep to the 45 minutes. So if you do watch the recording, you might have to put it on the slow version. Um, so I will, since I will maybe speak a little quickly, um, I'll also try to keep it a little bit active, um, get us moving a little bit because um, like Monique said, exercise is medicine. So we do need to do a little bit movement rather than just sit and listen to me talk this whole time. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen we'll get going. So um, yeah, so exercise smarter, evidence-based PD specific PT informed exercise. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about what this means here. So whoop, there we go. Um, so who am I? Um, I had a lovely introduction, so I don't think I need to dive too much further into that. Um, but this is a, a picture of me with Brian Grant up in Oregon during one of the Parkinson's um, conferences. Uh, doing a power through exercise program. So I love sharing that. Um, it was a really fun day. Um, and today our objectives that we're going to cover are who PTs are, in case you haven't encountered working with a PT, um, what Parkinson's uh, disease specific mobility concerns are, evidence guiding physical therapy practice, um, what exercise recommendations and movement principles are, how to think about PT as a coach within your um, within your paradigm, and then try tying it all together and what we can do. So we'll go through all of those together. So in terms of physical therapy, uh, for those of you that don't know, it is now a clinical doctoral degree, um, meaning it's an entry level degree after four years of an undergraduate program. So it's three years, um, entry-level clinical doctorate. Uh, it's a graduate program. Um, Sam Merritt University has a DPT program right here in Oakland. Um, also UCSF has one and Pacific uh, nearby in Stockton. So just to kind of give you some ideas of where some of these programs might be and the clinicians you might be seeing. Um, these clinicians, once they get their board certification, certified license. Um, so once they get licensed, they may continue on and do postdoctoral education in a specialty. So for me, um, I did some specialty training and I was able to get my neurologic clinical specialty. You may see some of these letters off of people's names like NCS or OCS, which is orthopedic clinical specialty or even oncology. Um, there's also uh, pediatrics. So we have specialties and that just means we have additional training. Um, we have more knowledge in that area. Um, we've done and we put in some clinical hours. There are also specific residencies and fellowship programs that some of our um, uh, clinicians may enter into to get more uh, learning and more specialty practice. All right. So um, moving on, what are the PD specific mobility concerns? This is probably something that you're already, because you're a savvy group, pretty, pretty familiar with. Um, but we'll just cover some topics. I'm going to link a lot of this more to balance specifically. Um, this is a really common uh, iceberg picture that you all have maybe seen before. 
but there's this um, combination of symptoms that people see and oftentimes part of what your how you end up with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease with the rigidity, tremor, um, akinesia, bradykinesia, so that slower movement, and then any changes in your postural disturbance or balance. Um, but what a lot of people don't see are all these non-motor symptoms that maybe are also occurring along with these or maybe have occurred first and, and are early symptoms of Parkinson's disease that maybe go really undiagnosed um, until some of those motor symptoms develop. Now, what's interesting with Parkinson's is that it's, you know, oftentimes uh, you're diagnosed an older population. So you're usually a little bit older. And as we age, there's also things that are going on with us that um, contribute or maybe complicate some of these motor concerns that occur due to Parkinson's. So just with um, balance in the general population, our vision changes as we age already. Um, we might have other comorbidities. So like changes in um, macular degeneration, we might be using different um, vision or progressive lenses like trifocals or bifocals that help kind of change our perception while we're walking or moving. Um, and then changes in our sensation or what um, physical therapy and physicians call somatosensory. So what, how you feel and how your touch is oftentimes around your feet. So that can change your balance as well. And then our vestibular system. This is a system that um, is really important for balance that sometimes we don't really talk about, but it's that inner ear balance system. It's that system that helps us not get dizzy when we're moving quickly or we stand up really fast or we turn around really quickly. Um, when our heads move quickly, it helps us not get dizzy. And all of these systems, the vision, somatosensory and vestibular typically work together to help us with our balance. And so if you see already as we age, these might be changing um, with a higher reliance on vision as our primary system to help us with balance. And we just aren't moving as much. I know that when I had my daughter, um, I had been a gymnast in the past and so I never really got dizzy. And I obviously wasn't doing gymnastics anymore, but my, I picked up my toddler child and I spun around in a circle and I was like, whoa, I got really dizzy because I hadn't been using that inner ear balance system as much or challenging it. So, you know, as we get older, we're maybe not doing as um, big of those movements. And so it already is changing. And so when we think of Parkinson's and, um, you know, I'm going to highlight these uh, motor issues that occur primarily with um, uh, that, that support balance is that there are changes in the processing of how you organize that information. So how you incorporate vision, vestibular and somatosensory um, because of the way that the basal ganglia is functioning. Um, and then you're also having trouble changing how you respond with your muscles. So meaning that when I say proper, uh, provides a properly scaled neuromuscular response, meaning how quickly you react. Are you, do you lift your foot up? Do you step out? Um, how do you react for balance challenges? Maybe aren't scaled appropriately. And then in the background, there's changes to muscle tone. So that stiffness, that rigidity, that tightness that might happen can affect how you are balancing. So we're gonna dive into these just a little bit more. Forget I did all that. There we go. Well, let's look at them all together. Um, so when we talk about sensory organization and how um, somebody with Parkinson's might be integrating visual, vestibular, and somatosensory for balance, um, these areas highlight those challenges. So in vision, um, Parkinson's affects your visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. So how sharply you can see changes in um, maybe the carpet to the different surfaces or even grass and gravel. Um, your eye movements are, your eyes have muscles just like the rest of your body. And so if you're moving slowly, now your eyes are actually have the potential to move a little bit slower. So it changes how quickly you integrate information that you're, you're looking at. 
Um, and then in general, as we age and is consistent with Parkinson's is we become over-reliant on all of that visual input. So we're, you know, we want to look at our feet, we want to look at the ground um, to see where we're going. And so that is a big piece. With vestibular, um, now you might not um, orient yourself as quickly. Um, that's what those delayed uh, and decreased writing reactions or postural reactions with head movements mean. So maybe I move my head quickly um, and my body maybe doesn't stay still, it might sway. Um, and then this uh, hypo function might occur, meaning you're not using that system as consistently because you're not moving it as much. So there's all these factors that are going in. So when you're not moving your head as much, you're not walking quickly or um, you know sitting on swings or challenging that system, then it's just like a muscle. It needs to be challenged. It needs to be worked. So that system gets a little bit weaker. Um, and then with Parkinson's, your somatosensory system, you tend to have a little bit harder time with limb position sense. So knowing kind of where your ankles or um, your wrists or arms are in space, not grossly, but even just minimal changes, changes how you lift and move your feet to maybe clear an item um, on the floor. And then um, changes in how the direction or understanding the direction or the amplitude of your movement. So how big or small you're moving um, and the direction. So if you can tell, right, all of that information and how those are changing um, contribute to how you integrate those that information for balance. All right, um, so for motor adjustment, so now thinking about how you get those muscles to activate to help you with balance, maybe it's more delayed. So you're not actually in, improving your posture or correcting your balance, which contributes to your fall risk. And then when you do react, maybe it's too big or maybe it's too small or nothing really happens when you're challenged with your balance. Um, and then uh, we typically use different ways of helping us balance. Like we might use our ankles and I'm using my wrist here, but our ankles might adjust. You know, if you're standing, you'll feel your ankles kind of move. That's an ankle strategy. Um, our hips kind of move. That's a hip strategy. If you think of someone on a surfboard or a um, snowboard and then um, and and then uh, the firing of those muscles might occur in a different order. So it's um, so you're moving too big, you're moving too small. Maybe you don't um, get those active uh, muscles where you want them at the right time or in the right order. And so now you've got sensory integration issues and some motor adjustment concerns contributing to your fall risk. And then in the back of all of this is that background muscle tone where you're feeling tight and stiff. Um, and for physical therapists, we assess that by moving your body, moving your leg, moving your arms, um, looking at how you rotate your trunk to see um, what happens with your underlying muscle tone. How this might show up for you is it might show up as your arms not swinging normally to your side when you walk. Um, when you turn around, instead of your head moving separate from your body, maybe it moves kind of all together, sort of like one unit. Um, and then um, when you're asleep and you're trying to move in bed, it contributes to reduced body rotation during sleep. So part of what can contribute to difficulty getting in and out of bed or moving in bed. Um, this also contributes a bit to just in general walking and moving um, now, if you think about that stiffness, now, if all of this is happening, well, now you're not moving that head separate from your body, which is then contributing to that, those challenges we talked about with vestibular balance. So not, I know this is all the not so fun stuff, but wanted to give you an appreciation for um, how all those elements go into balance and that from the physical therapy standpoint, um, this is all the information that our students learn about when it comes to Parkinson's and are on the lookout for um, to help create more targeted exercise programs for people with Parkinson's.
um, rather than just saying, I'm working on your balance, they will have a more targeted approach to understand exactly what part of balance they're working on. And so where's the evidence that guide how PTs um, start to um, support people with Parkinson's? So PT, um, we help improve how you move. Um, and what we're focusing on is exercise and task specific training, meaning if you want to do better at getting in and out of a chair, then we practice getting in and out of a chair. Um, I know that sounds really clear and boring, but uh, hopefully we can make it fun and we can change it up and use different types of training tools to work on that. But function and task specific training is critical. Um, what the research also supports is that early referral to PT. So even if you're pretty mobile, um, you haven't had any real big challenges in your mobility yet, we want to see you as early as possible so we can get a baseline assessment of kind of where you're starting from so that we can give you targeted um, recommendations early to then hopefully combat any, any changes as you progress um, or hopefully don't progress that much. And, uh, and the other recommendations in um, all of the literature is that um, to look at PT as a coach. So similar to a dental model where you're going to get your checkups, if you're doing pretty well, you probably just need to check in with your PT for a short period of time. And then, um, and then you go on your way with your home exercise program and you're working hard and then maybe do a check-in in like three to six months. So it doesn't have to be this long drawn out time frame. Maybe you just need occasional tune-ups that are targeted and specific for your needs. Um, we also really uh, focus on an interdisciplinary team approach. So we involve OT, speech therapy, and communicate closely with your um, physician, which um, the recommendation is if you don't already have one, rather than a neurologist, a movement disorder specialist, um, as well as if you have the access to neuropsych or um, supportive services for your mental health, that is also um, recommended. Um, I'm gonna get through a few more of these and then I'm gonna pause to see how the questions are going. Um, what I wanna highlight here, and I know this is a slide with a lot of words, and so feel free to kind of dive into this later if you wanna look, but um, I did wanna give this to you all because this is sort of the gold standard recommendation from the European guidelines on um, kind of why you would be referred to PT. And their research um, was very extensive on how influential PT can be early in referral for people with Parkinson's in preventing falls and hospitalizations. Um, what you see on the left-hand side is sort of when you might be referred. So you might be referred in early, so an initial diagnosis, um, and then the description on the other side is kind of like why that's important. So um, you might be getting more self-management advice, education, coaching, um, support to stay active, and maybe some tailored interventions to prevent change. Um, if you are having specific impairments or limitations in what you're doing, so in your activities, so maybe you're having trouble getting out of bed, um, maybe things aren't as easy for you to manage, um, you know, in terms of manipulating with your hands, or um, you're a runner and now it's trickier to, to run, or you're having more challenges with balance, that's another opportunity for a referral to PT um, to work on these specific task practices. Um, and then another time you might see PT is if you are having a hospitalization or in a um, skilled nursing facility, uh, then oftentimes you'll be referred to PT to get some support in mobility while you're there. Um, again, I'm not gonna dive all the way into this, but this is um, the recommend, recommended information about uh, when you're referred. So your physician will refer you to PT, um, and this is the information that they will uh, include, uh, which includes your diagnosis, year and stage, um, what's going on with you motor-wise, and then your current medical treatment and any comorbidities. When you do show up for PT, um, 
it's important to know what we're going to start off with asking you. We're going to ask you a lot of questions. So we want to know what your medication is, um, what type, your timing, when was your last dose. And we may ask this every visit because we want to have a better understanding of when you're having your on or off period. Um, we're also going to ask a lot of questions about falls and if you're having any freezing of gait. Um, so before you come to your PT appointment, if you can, you know, kind of reflect on any of those times so that you can be really clear and specific. Oh, I, I only freeze when I'm going through door doorways or when I'm turning around to sit in a chair, I really get stuck. Um, I tend to uh, catch my foot anytime I'm going up a curb. I, you know, these kind of things are really important or I get, I get kind of um, off balance when it's dark or when I'm on uneven surfaces. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a big fall. It could be more like trips, slips or stumbles and where you just generally feel unbalanced. Um, we also want to know, do you use anything ever, even if it's hiking poles on big hikes or if you're using a walker or any other assistive device or need support in any way at home? because that'll also help us target our assessment and then interventions to support you. Um, and finally, we're gonna ask you, what's a lot of information? Oh, why did I go backwards or forwards? We're gonna ask you a lot of information about your current exercise program, what type, how often, and if you're not doing exercise, are you willing to do exercise and what type of exercise are you um, interested in? And so I am gonna take a little pause here and just kind of do a check-in. Monique, are there big glaring questions that I should address now or should I wait to the end? Well, it seems like it might be a good time for a couple of the questions that have come in around referrals. Sure. Um, so a couple of people have asked, you know, about, you know, how do I get the referral, that kind of thing. I think there's two specific questions. One, one woman asked, well, when do I start? It's never been recommended to me. Um, you know, how do I know when I need it? Um, and but I, I think it would be beneficial. So I, mean, yeah. I know a lot of, you know, plans that we have, like at Kaiser, you need a referral. You can't just go to a, a, a so how likely are you, would you go to your, would you go to your primary care doctor or your movement disorder specialist for the referral? Good questions. Yeah. So e either one should be fine um, because they, they both can equally make the referral. Um, I know that in Kaiser, our goal is that um, our goal was, and I, I think it's still continuing is that as soon as you're diagnosed, you're referred immediately to PT. Um, and so whether that's like super early in the stage or if you've come through the Kaiser uh, uh, system a little later, you get immediately referred. Um, my recommendation is if you're interested in having a physical therapy assessment, and especially if you've never had one, um, most physicians, especially neurologists and movement disorder specialists are open to that referral. So I think advocating for yourself and just saying, you know, um, I know that there's a lot out there supporting movement and Parkinson's and these and PT. I'd love to get a targeted assessment on my balance and movement um, so that I can know exactly where I should focus to keep myself moving the way I want, you know, and, and or if you're having trouble specifically with any um, activities, getting out of bed, um, balance, getting in and out of a chair. Anytime you mention safety to your um, or fall risk to your physician, they're pretty apt to make the referral to PT. So um, if you kind of kind of use that, I'm worried I'm going to fall yeah. <laughs> and I love it, a referral to PT, then then I don't see any reason why they would um, not make that referral. That's a great trick <laughs> to use the word fall. Um, and someone asked about Medicare not covering more than 10 visits per year. Um, it sounds like if you if you sort of get an initial evaluation and then get set up and have these periodic check-ins that that might be sufficient. Yeah, oftentimes, especially if someone's more early on in their um, their diagnosis and we can get in really soon. Um, sometimes my visits are my initial visit with someone might only be two to three sessions max. Um, just to get a targeted assessment and recommendations kind of going. 
Um, and then sometimes uh, I will do phone call check-ins at like the month, two month or three month mark, just to kind of see how things are going. And then anytime there's a change in status, meaning your movement's changing, something's different, then that's another time to ask for a referral back to PT. And then when you're asking for the referral, you you can specify that you want somebody that has that is certified in neurology or has experience with Parkinson's. Like, is that a yeah, reasonable Yeah, I request? would, absolutely. I would, um, I would ask your physician to be clear on the referral to ask for a neurologic physical therapist. Um, and oftentimes that is, uh, you know, you can find a neuro PT in most, uh, most facilities. Um, and I would be clear about that. And if you're calling to make the appointment, you can always ask specifically, does this person work with people with Parkinson's disease um, on a regular basis? And I don't think it's a problem to ask that because you do want somebody that is comfortable and understands how to work with people with Parkinson's because you are unique and wonderful. And, um, and there's a lot of literature targeting movement that your clinician should know about and integrate into, um, into your sessions. Uh, I will say that entry-level PTs are educated on, um, on working with people with Parkinson's, um, you know, but if you're not practicing it on a regular basis, you know, you kind of get out of that practice. So, um, so that's my recommendation is if you can see someone that, that is versed in PT or, um, people with PD, I would, I would recommend that. Okay. Um, and again, that NCS at the end of somebody's name is a nice, uh, cue, but is not the only cue because some that people, N that's that, that neurologic clinical specialist. NCS. Mm -hmm. After their so, name. Yep. If you see that after anyone's name, that means that they have had extra, um, they have extra knowledge and and uh, clinical hours with people with Parkinson's, with people with neurologic diagnoses, including Parkinson's. Great. Okay. Thank you. I think that's it for the, the, for the okay. referral question. Okay. I'm glad this was a, that was a good little good check break. in. Yes. Okay. All right. So what else do we do after you're referred to PT? We might have some information supporting you in appropriate assistive devices. Um, in the, Rather than just focusing on the patient, we can also support caregivers and um, help you understand, help caregivers learn how to help somebody move better or help with support or guarding or um, even verbal cueing can be very tricky. Like what's the right cue to tell somebody how to move? Um, and so we can talk through that with caregivers as well. Um, we may refer you for more nutrition support and um and then also talk to you a little bit more about medication optimization with exercise. This is not the, the, the focus of my talk today, but that is really important to maximize movement. So taking um, your, your dopaminergic um, close to when you're going to be exercise, exercising will optimize your mobility. Um, and then uh, I always say a referral to mental health um, and supportive therapies is really important. I know that's tricky and hard to come by, um, but I know that if um, if you can't get those supportive services and or have the means to um, pay out of pocket, uh, those supportive services are highly recommended. And then one, one thing that maybe gets sort of pushed to the side as, oh, well, you're also just getting older and that's just part of life is, um, is that actually having, um, urinary, uh, issues, either, um, urgency or, or leaking, those can actually be a, a contributing underlying non-motor symptom for Parkinson's and having that addressed and identified and supported by a urologist, I think is also another really important piece, um, of this whole puzzle that I think sometimes gets sort of swept away and ignored. And it's certainly a contribution to your quality of life. So we might have those discussions with you and help support any of those referrals when you have your PT appointment. Um, okay, so I know this is a big weird slide. This, it, these are the exams recommended by the evidence for physical therapists to administer um, with to people with Parkinson's. The highly recommended ones. 
Um, there are a whole bunch of different measures and some of them are more like questionnaires. So you'll see these terms over here on the right, a freezing of gait questionnaire, um, your fatigue scale. This is a fear of falling, the ABC scale. And then um, a dual task uh, timed up and go cog, which is basically you get out of a chair, you walk 10 feet, you go around a cone and you come back and sit in a chair, but while you're doing it, you're doing a cognitive task. So we're looking at your ability to move and do a cognitive task at the same time. Um, in this middle, larger part here um, are some other exams, and we're going to do a few in just a moment, um, but we might do a six-minute walk test with you to look at your endurance. A 10-meter walk test looks at your gait speed, how fast you can walk, which is really important because um, certain gait speeds indicate your risk for falling um, or how fast you can walk across um, the street to cross a, a typical street with a street light. And so we look at those and those numbers and where they correlate with your risk for falls. Um, the best test uh, is, a, is a nice name because it really makes it stand out, but it is a really long, probably 15 minute long motor test of like a whole bunch of these tests all put together. Um, so sometimes we pull out pieces of the best test. So for example, one of them we're gonna do in a moment. Um, functional gait assessment, I'm gonna show you a video of that. And then the five times sit to stand we're gonna do. Um, and then the nine hole peg test looks at your dexterity um, and your ability to move some pegs from one, one side to another. Um, and then this is the participation PDQ eight or PDQ nine is a, another questionnaire form. All right, so let me stop my share. Okay, we're gonna do a five times sit to stand for those of you that are able. Um, what I'm going to ask is that you perform this in a non rolling chair. If you are doing it from a rolling chair, I'm gonna close my eyes and pretend I don't see you doing it. Um, but please have something to hold on to. <laughs> Thank you. I see you, Todd, grabbing a non-rolling chair. Um, and essentially the goal of this is to get up and down from a chair five times. Um, practice is okay if you need to practice without using your hands to push up. So I either tell people to cross their hands across their body or put their hands in front of them forward. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen for a stopwatch. And when I say go, I will start the stopwatch. And then your job is to do your five times sit to stand and then see when you sit your bottom down, what number is on the screen. Okay. Can I get some thumbs up either in the screen like this or you, that makes sense? Okay. And then we'll talk about the results. So give me a minute. I'll pull up my stopwatch here. All right, so now I can't see any of you, so um, please be careful. Arms crossed or in front of you, and when I say go, I will start the stopwatch. Ready and go. Oop, it paused. Is it still going? Oh, there we go. It's still going. All right, how's everyone doing? Is everyone done? Hopefully everyone finished, everyone finish? Did I stop it too soon? We're good, okay. I'm seeing mostly thumbs up. All right, so can some people throw in the chat what numbers they got? And if you needed to use your hands, that's good too. Okay. 13, 19. Yeah. Nice. Great. Great. Thanks for sharing these numbers. I'll give just another few seconds to get some more numbers going. 
And as you can see, right, there's a huge variability in the numbers popping into the chat. My excuse is that the boss glitch kind of added five seconds. Oh, it could have. I will just, we'll say it did. We'll totally say it did. I know it just kind of, I think it was like, okay, but it was weird. It kind of glitched, huh? So you can also time yourself later. Um, so we'll talk about what those results mean. So in the literature, um, 16 seconds is a cutoff for um, fallers versus non-fallers. So it is um, found in the literature that people, and that's a specific number for Parkinson's. Um, separate from age-related numbers. So there are numbers out there specific for age and gender, and then there are numbers specific for people with Parkinson's. And the 16 is our cutoff, meaning above 16 typically will indicate that you're at a higher risk for falling um, than under 16. Now, if we look at, if you're like, well, I actually am moving pretty well in general, what are the other numbers that I'm aiming for? Because you're a really competitive person. Um, around that uh, 12 is is another good number to kind of aim for that 12 or 13 would be a little bit um, another number for like a cutoff uh, for age related specific. Herb, do you have a question? Oh. All right, so that's something that your PT will probably look at and and again, it's not the only thing that helps think about what your fall risk might be. It's just a, a component. So we're gonna do another one. And let me find where my slides went. All right, so then the next one we're gonna do is, um, this is called the modified CTSIB. It's like, a, it's basically that um, systems, those systems that we were talking about, your vestibular, um, your somatosensory, and your vision. Um, I don't like these pictures, they're not the best, but essentially you're gonna be doing some balancing with your eyes open, some balancing with your eyes closed, some balance on a soft surface, eyes open and balance, eyes closed. So for the purposes of today, we're gonna do the first two. Um, a CTSIB stands for what? For those, it's of us? like a sensory integrated balance assessment. All I can send um, that written out for you guys. Um, so if you're ready and you feel safe and you have something nearby, oh, I see everyone's getting ready. Love it. Um, if you can put your feet close together so that they're touching, so not just kind of close, but actually touching. This is called Romberg position. And you're going to stand up and cross your arms over your chest. And I'm going to time you for 30 seconds, starting now with eyes open, eyes open. And all you want to do right now is just kind of notice how you're feeling. Do you feel yourself swaying? Do you notice, you know, where your senses are? And most people are usually pretty good with this one. I'm just kind of looking around. If you have any balance, um, like neuropathy or anything like that, um, this might be a little bit challenging. But everyone looks pretty good. All right, we're over 30 seconds. So you can take a little mini break. Put your feet apart for a second. Hopefully you weren't holding your breath that whole time too. I know I do that when I do some of these exercises. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the same position, but we're going to close our eyes. Don't close your eyes until I tell you to, and make sure you have something to hold on to if you need to um, open and, and grab. Now, when you do close your eyes, I want to note that it's okay if you move a little, okay? But you want to try to keep those feet together, not step apart, and just kind of notice what happens with your body. So... The first assessment was looking at your balance and how you use the information from your feet while still using your vision um, to help you orient your body. Now we're gonna take vision away and your brain is gonna need to use that information from your feet to continue to help you stay balanced, okay? So the feet again are, are together or shoulder width? Feet or? are still together, okay. yep. The feet are together for all of these. So if you're in position, 
I'm going to say go and I'll start the timer ready and go. I, some of you are going to get an extra second or two. And I'm going to say quiet for this one. Doing good there, Carol. Sarah, nice job. And eyes open, feet apart. Nice work. All wow, right. I felt, like a, I felt like a tall tree in a stiff wind on that one. It's different, right? When you take your vision out of it. So, yeah. so that what that's now looking at, right, is okay. You, you know, if you felt like you were moving around a bit, then you're really reliant on your vision. Um, and it means that you're like, you know, when it's dark out or you're on uneven surfaces, it might be a little bit trickier. Um, if you find that you're touching uh, furniture when you're walking around, that could also be a contributing factor, just recognizing that you're really highly visually dependent. The next two assessments we're not going to do right now, but um, but it's to get on a soft surface. So sometimes I'll have people put a yoga mat, fold it a couple of times over, or even a pillow. And my recommendation for this to set yourself up safely is to be in a um, in a corner. So I like corners of a room because then you're you're pretty safe. You can't go anywhere and then put a chair in front of you. So you're nice and locked in, but allows you to move a little because your body should adjust and it's okay for it to sway. Um, but that's a really nice way to challenge your balances. Um, so then you would do that with your feet together, eyes open on foam, and then eyes closed on foam. And I would recommend having a spotter for the first time you try eyes closed. If you don't have access to the foam or you want to challenge your vestibular system just to see how it works, um, another way you could do that is to do the same thing we just did on regular surface and try moving your head. Eyes open and then just see what that does while you're standing. Does that change what happens? And then what if you close your eyes and you felt pretty good with your eyes closed? Then what if you moved your head while your eyes were closed? What does that do to your balance? So that's incorporating those different systems and giving them little challenges. Um, and so uh, PTs, we'll, we'll do this assessment, we'll look at that, and then we'll kind of tease out which system we really want to focus in on. Do we really want to focus in on that vestibular system? It's usually the case. Um, or do we want to really upload your somatosensory system? Maybe your brain is so visually dependent, it forgot that you had feet. Um, that could help you balance. So just spending time with your eyes closed and kind of feeling that your feet, you know, maybe moving from your heels to your toes, that's a nice way to kind of bring in that system. What about footwear? Footwear. Um, what do you mean by what about it? Um, if it's too bulky of, of a shoe, you're not going to, they're going to give you wrong reads. Exactly. Yeah. So we usually do this assessment barefoot. Um, and then in terms of like footwear, um, if you're feeling really off balance, oftentimes I recommend a, a, a lower, you know, cushion, um, like you just said, yeah, super cushiony. You're going to have, it, it's going to just be different. Right. All right. Nice job, everybody. All right. So now we have these assessments. We'll kind of go forwards here. I want to show you what it would look like to do some walking assessment. And I know I'm getting close on my time, but this has been more fun. Um, so this is uh, your functional gait assessment and I'll speed through it a little bit, but essentially, and this is somebody with a stroke, not someone with Parkinson's. Um, they just, we look at how you walk. Um, and then we might look at how you walk fast and then slow. Can you change your speeds? And then the next would be, can you walk and look to the right and then look to the left and what happens with your balance and your walking? And then you guessed it. We also look at looking up and looking down. Gate and pivot turn, meaning how you turn and stop after walking. And then what happens when you step over something? Can
can be tricky. And then this one's really hard. It's looking at if can you walk with your one foot in front of the other one, kind of like a tightrope. And you got to do 10 of those. Then we ask you to walk with your eyes closed for about 10 feet. We're guarding you. And we look at how you walk backwards. And then what steps look like for you. Can't, do you use a railing? Do you use two railings? Can you go one foot after another? Or do you have to go two steps at a time? And, when, and then also down. So all of those assessments um, go into looking at your balance, your risk for falling, and help us and, and we do more than just that, but those help us figure out how to target and, and give you specific exercise recommendations um, for you. Um, do you there, compare left, right dominance? For walking? Yeah, like if I lead, they normally lead with their left. Do they step over with their right? Do most people favor one side over the other? Yeah, we're okay with whatever you choose. For, for but that if that's assessment. a weakness, wouldn't you want to train it? Maybe if they go the other, could lead with the right foot instead of the left, that might be a Totally. Big, uh, so we probably would get to that, but for the purpose of the assessment, we're looking at your preference and your, your best demonstration for that and what you would prefer. So we, um, cause that's just sort of the, the, the first assessment. We'll probably dive in a little bit more, like you said, like, okay, well, if that's your best performance, what's your other one look like? And we'll probably dive in because we definitely don't want you only using one side. Um, in terms of exercise, uh, there's some you know foundational work that that's out there that we um, look at and uh, really thinking about um, how evidence of your reliance on sort of that attentional mechanisms um, is is what people use when they're when they're exercising and moving because you have that defective basal ganglia. Um, but we have found that movement, normal movement can be obtained if you can bypass that basal ganglia. And so what does that mean? But it's about like, how do we really apply some of the evidence to kind of bypass that? So the evidence in, um, this is a clinical practice guideline for people um, with Parkinson's for physical therapy practice. So our students learn this, um, all clinicians have access to the CPG. And this is um, specific for idiopathic or more typical Parkinson's, so um, not specific to Parkinsonisms. Um, and it, it suggests that aerobic exercise is strongly supported with moderate to high intensity as showing redu reduction in motor disease and improved outcomes. Strength training is highly recommended, strong recommendations for that. And balance um, is also strongly recommended. So any types of balance training um, with evidence supporting improvements in quality of life, um, posture, um, and, and for strength, uh, general motor strength. We also, um, they also found for and recommend for the CPG, the external cueing. So external cueing means like lines on the floor, um, visual aids, um, auditory cueing, like a rhythm or a song to help keep your walking speed um, or counting, uh, any type of external visual auditory or um, uh, like those visual or auditory cues are important. So the, um, the gait training is also strongly supported. So meaning that's another area that the physical therapist might focus on as well as task specific training. So these are, you know, why I'm showing you this is this is the education that our, our PT students get and your, and your clinicians get. Um, and we understand that our approach to interventions with someone with Parkinson's should incorporate all of these things with a very specific focus on what you as an individual would need. Um, what's weak is really to focus solely on flexibility. Um, it might be helpful to do rotational activities uh, to help with um, decreasing that rigidity in the trunk musculature. 
And um, also tele-rehab for just balance is weekly supported. So if you're doing balance classes over um, video, it's probably not the best. And, you know, this, why do you think I, you know, my thoughts are that it's probably has a lot to do with not getting the adequate challenge. Um, behavior change approaches is moderately supported. And what that's about is asking, um, is, is working with you on how to kind of um, focus on getting past maybe that the core initiation of an exercise program and helping you be in the more active stage of applying an exercise program. But what's really great, and I know that PD Active really supports, is that community-based exercise is strongly supported in the literature with 57 studies um, that looked at programs where folks exercise together. And this is highly supported, supportive in the literature for people with Parkinson's as benefiting mobility as well as quality of life. Say, so Angela, I'm going to interrupt for a second and just yeah. kind of time check here. I know. Coming up on 630. Um, and I know you've got some slides to go. If you would like to cherry pick the last few slides so we can try to. Yeah. Really I'm going to jump ahead. Um, you all have this slide. This is a nice one to give you some exercise recommendations with more specifics. And so what I'm going to jump ahead to is really kind of putting it together. Um, so really, you want to move bigger than you think you can. You want to have a higher intensity and reset your motor drive. So meaning if you like to move kind of slower, we need to move you faster and harder with high effort. So if you're doing a Zumba class, it, you need to be doing the Zumba class. Big, high effort, really put in your, your whole body into it. And then checking in with yourself um, to see, you know, am I moving as big as I can? Am I, am I, am I putting in that effort that I can? Other movement principles include weight shifting. Can, shifting your weight side to side will help with anti-freezing. So if you are in a standing position right now, just shift in your weight. From one foot to the other one, can you lift it up? Can you add a stepping activity? So stepping out and back, forwards, backwards. So lifting the foot off the ground and moving it. Rotational activities help with that decrease in rigidity. So just rotating your body and getting those real big stretches in a rotation. I like the open book stretches. And then posture. So you want to stretch the front of your body and strengthen the back of your body to help with posture. I'm going to skip this one, just more evidence. And so I gave some recommendations here. We talked about that balance system integration. Rotational activities can really help with that rigidity and helping you embed moving that head, even just getting your head moving. There are some ideas for that weight shifting and stepping that we just talked about with more specifics to help with balance. And then thinking about, you know, we've kind of highlighted this, you know, why not just take an exercise class? Yes, let's use those exercise classes, but having PT as coach can help um, support that individual assessment and give you tailored recommendations to apply to your exercise program. So build a team, making sure you're the hub, you're driving this. Uh, healthcare system's not that great at coordinating care. So knowing who the players are and definitely asking for them. Um, you should really make sure you include aerobic training, PD specific skill training, posture, weight shifting, twisting, stepping, and strength training, which is not on there. I think classes are great. Um, practice throughout the day. So if you're getting up out of a chair, don't just get up out of the chair, but get up big out of the chair, move big. And then thinking about using an exercise log to help really highlight what you're doing and identify any gaps is a really nice way to help see with what you're doing. And I've included this particular um, log sheet that you can edit and change and adjust. Um, in the, uh, in the content that I sent to Todd and Monique. So um, you'll have access to this, but this is just an example where you can see on the side, this is what I'm aiming for. And then looking into your week, what are you actually achieving? Recognizing that some of these have dual um, components, you know, agility, balance, um, 
there's a strength training you might be doing some yoga, which includes strength, flexibility, and balance all together. So just kind of keeping those in mind. And then um, just a plug for Samuel Merritt. We do have uh, pro bono experiences with uh, group classes that are going to occur in the fall coming up. Um, I mean, after summer, I guess. So we not coming up as soon as I'd like, but feels closer than it appears. Mm -hmm. uh, September 9th through December 2nd. And they're usually in the afternoon. And that's the contact person, Dr. Reyna. And then in the spring term, um, we'll have uh, the CPL classes. So I um, that starts usually mid-February on Tuesday afternoons. I can answer any questions. Thanks for your patience. I told you I I I knew I'd go long. <laughs> <laughs> That's we were good. having so much fun with our movement. It, it all it's all wonderful information. I think we're we're doing great. We have plenty of time for questions, so no worries. Um, it was good least, that we inserted some in the middle there too. <clears throat> yeah. So it seems like uh, on that last slide you had the log, and it seems like. Um, you're going by the recommendation of moderate exercise, 30 to 60 minutes, three to five, three, three to five times a week. Um, and I think that's sort of like the basic exercise requirement. Do you think that's also the, the basic exercise requirement for preventing the pro progression of Parkinson's? Or can you speak to that? I don't know if you could speak to that, but there's a lot in the literature about exercise as, pre as prevention, as preventing progression. In addition yes. to all the wonderful things that you're saying. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. So that is, that's absolutely true. Aerobic exercise is critical as part of your exercise program and moderate exercise for me is going to look different than moderate exercise for you. Um, for, you know, anyone in my family, we're, we're all going to have a different level. So don't compare yourself to others when you're thinking of moderate intensity. Um, I think that's important. Um, but yes, uh, it is, uh, it, what's, what's really hard concept that I always talk to my patients about is that if you do nothing, um, then it's actually pro degenerative, you're going to progress faster um, by being really sedentary and not pushing yourself and, and adding these exercise um, programs in. So doing something is better than doing nothing. So I don't want anyone sort of paralyzed by Oh, I got to do three to five times a moderate, even going on a walk for 10 minutes, like getting out and, and going on a walk or doing an interval of a walk. So meaning if moderate intensity feels a little like, what does that mean? Go on your normal walk and maybe between um, one point and another, can you walk really fast and big? Can you push yourself faster than what feels comfortable um, for, and doing that intermittently throughout your walk. It doesn't have to be sustained the whole time, but that's a really nice way to kind of do that pushing past your preferred pace. So maybe just yeah. doing little interval, your own little interval trainings with yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I think okay. it could be kind of overwhelming to keep that pace the whole time or really be focused on this high effort, large amplitude movement for the whole time. But if you do it in more of an interval and a focused and intentional way, you're actually going to have uh, more benefit. I think, I, 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 well, go ahead. Who's that? The intervals, like uh, I have bad dyskinesia, so I'm moving all the time. Yeah. So I can't really exercise for an hour straight. Correct. I'm exhausted. Exactly. But I You're... can work out five to 10 minutes every hour or every two hours. Mm -hmm. And good, so Ian. that is um, high intensity for me. And so we got to understand as parking, the high intensity means different things to different people. Absolutely. And these recommendations, like I said, are, are specific for like idiopathic Parkinson's doesn't take into account specifics where like dyskinesias or other, um, you know, Parkinsonisms uh, that maybe are affecting people differently. Um, the three to five times a week stuff is, is just, is also general for um, I think most people, it's sort of the World Health Organization recommendations as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That's why I think, you know, if you either working with your physician or working with your PT to help really target um, what that means for you is critical for sure. Yeah. I don't, I'm the one that posed about uh, uh, aqua fitness. There's no swimming on your chart. And I swim six days a week, which is where I'm pulling my exercise from. And um, I don't know whether you need to modify the chart or 
or this is no good for me. I mean, because mm -hmm. there's no water whatsoever on your chart. Yeah, so that chart is just an example. You get to fill in whatever is aerobic for you. Um, and so swimming definitely counts. Vivian, we will send that chart out in a Word document, a Microsoft Word document within the next couple of days when we respond with a follow-up email to everyone that registered for this event. That would be very yeah. helpful. I appreciate that. And then you go into that thing yourself and you modify it the way you want it. And uh, I use a version of that before I before I received Angela's and I'm going to use Angela's tomorrow. Um, and it's helpful on a weekly basis to log what you're doing. You feel better about yourself. You, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a good pro, pro productivity manager. Um, it's and, certainly uh, just a recommendation, not, yeah. not these are what you have to do. It just was an example. But if you can look on that left-hand side, the left-hand side is, um, is really focused more on um, giving you, the guidelines of the activity but the activity itself you can you can alter well and it's helpful to expand your thinking too about exercise is not just aerobic exercise and strength training it, it's also like you said it's it's the external cueing and the gait training and all these other things which i think is really a helpful view of a physical therapist um, I particularly like to incorporate agility training. We pull mm -hmm. out the, uh, you know, the agility ladder and I get people jumping um, in and out of those things. And we do, uh, I get people on the treadmill and we do um, 180 and 360 degree turns on the treadmill and dual task training on the treadmill. And you're like, wait, I can't do that. I will tell you, you would be surprised. You can. Um, after what? We got to practice first, but. But what about um, uh, people who have balance problems, um, you know, aerobic activities might be difficult. Are there specific recommendations that you have for people who have? Recumbent bikes are great. You know, you can still get, or even um, upper body ergs for your, for your arms, um, anything. If you can do a lot of um, like the swimming, right. For, for balance um, issues swimming and you can get aerobic training that way as well. So there's um, a lot of options. You don't, if you're feeling uncomfortable about getting out and walking or getting on a treadmill or something and standing, anything and sitting that gets your heart rate up, that's aerobic. That's um, great. At PD Active, we have um, Tai Chi for gait and balance class. That's really helpful. And we even have a chair yoga class. We have all different kinds of classes that are PD specific. So I'll put the link in the chat for people to check out when they have a chance. Thank well, you. And a follow-up question to that was, I, I was surprised to see on your slide that you said that there was like weak evidence for, I think the balance training over video, the telehealth. And yeah. what about other telehealth? exercise what about doing video versus in person do you yeah do you i don't know the evidence specifically but i do know that um the evidence supporting the group classes through um video is um is still supported um i think that uh you know like i know claire mclean does some really great online videos i think the balance specifically it's because you can't get an adequate challenge safely um, and so it's more that you're not going to see the same change, but I think any of the, um, like the power moves or more aerobic specific, um, through video, uh, typically have higher, uh, supportive evidence. So Angela, uh, I think if we correct me if I'm wrong, if I think about exercise for parkies in sort of two classes, one is a general aerobic, um, type of exercise that just makes us generally feel better at the end of say 30 or 40 minutes. Um, because we've started to kickstart the substantia nigra into producing more dopamine. And the other would be symptom specific exercises that if we're shuffling, shuffling our gait or my arm's not swinging and I need to be more big when I walk and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. that is that safe and, and, and accurate enough? I, I like that combo. That sounds good to me. Um, okay. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a lot of what we're, we'll look at is um, you know, Yes, aerobic goes over here, but then when you see people, when you see a PT, we're going to dive really into um, kind of, you know, sometimes people don't like as much as we get a little nitpicky, but, you know, if you're not lifting your foot up big enough, we're going to want it bigger, right? And we're going to want you to step out. And then um, we might be using those external cues to, to look at movement. Um, you know, maybe you're working on power move with a posture 
maybe you're stopping here. We might have you get to the wall so that you can feel that external cue and know when you're actually getting big. Yeah. So it's also helping you understand what's um, what's really getting that larger amplitude high effort versus when you're maybe not meeting that and being able to regulate that and find ways to get there. Because I think that's, that's the trick, right? Is that um, movement feels normal for you. Um, and when, um, when we're sort of highlighting that we're looking at you wanting to move you bigger. And I know, I know we had Sue and CPL and, um, worked on that a bit on like really getting those big movements, you know, and it's, um, it's surprising because you feel like you're moving normal. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's, that's how we want to do it. That's, that feels better. Um, and just kind of highlighting that, uh, you know, gait as well. Sometimes people are walking pretty well, um, but with your preferred pace. And so when we push you a little bit harder, we might uncover um, where you may be not getting the right step length, or you maybe aren't lifting your foot as much as you think, or your, your steps are not as even as you, it feels like most of the time. So if we're pushing you a little bit more, we might uncover some areas to really um, focus in on. Yeah. And one of the reasons I bring that up is just because I know a couple of our attendees were keen on maybe getting some very specific exercise recommendations for very specific PD symptoms. As all of us Parkies know, um, there are a lot of symptoms that we could have. We may not have some that somebody else has and, and vice versa. So we, I think this, if nothing else, I hope, would hope that this presentation would encourage folks to go get a PD appointment get yourself a referral for a PD appointment, walk through your symptoms with that physical therapist and try to get some very specific symptom specific exercises carved out for you. Um, so if we tried to do that here today, I think it might be more like a five hour round table. So um, I'm sorry that we're not able to do that on a very custom individualized basis, but absolutely get yourself a PT appointment and, and figure out what some of those general, maybe more aerobic exercises might be and what some of the very symptom specific exercises would be for you. So we're not trying to, ignore, we're not ignoring you. We just want you to know that we're trying to cover a lot of bases here. I, I'm an ex coach and when I exercise, I plan my exercise tactically. So I have an offensive tactic when I'm mm -hmm. on, uh, that's how I exercise. I have a mm -hmm. transitional exercises when I'm going from an on to an off or an off to an on. And I have a defensive tactic exercises when I'm on an off program. And, and to me, it seems to work very well. It makes me understand why I'm exercising or what I'm exercising for. That's yeah, great. That's, and, and Chad actually had a question in the chat regarding exercising on, on and off periods. Um, so this is a good segue. Um, he says, for someone able to hike and walk both on and off meds, um, is there any benefit to doing some hike, hiking during the off periods, maybe to improve your off function? Great question. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I think when you're on, you're just max, you know, you're going to increase your dopaminergic uh, reuptake when you're exercising, just like higher reuptake, you're going to maximize it. Um, when you're off, it's there's no downside into doing it while you're off. I think exercise on the off period is absolutely appropriate. Just understand, um, like Ian was mm -hmm. saying, how you move when you're exercising and you're off period so that you can anticipate. And I think what, what you're saying, being defensive with um, with how you go about it so that, um, you know, if you're hiking um, and you typically don't use hiking poles, maybe you should bring your hiking poles and then um, so that you maintain your balance and you use those to be more specific and intentional when you're using the off period. So that more focused attention to your movement would be more critical during that time. I think that's important because I went on a nine hour canoe trip this summer. I went through three cycles. So I had to learn how to cope when, when I'm out in a canoe in the water during an off, off time. Yeah. You know, it, it, and that's when we're out in the general public. We can be in a crowded supermarket store and all of a sudden we're in off. How do I cope? How do I get out of that? Absolutely. And that's we got to, it's important that we exercise. In this. Yep. Um, I also would like this question here about how to motivate um, people to do bigger steps, raise arms higher, move faster. 
Um, I use a lot of voice modulation for my external cues. So, you know, if I say, okay, everyone, you know, let's sit up and open our chests up and everyone opens their chest up, but then I might say, open your chest, big, open, right? <laughs> like that's going to kind of wake you up a little bit more. So I use um, that, the, um, the faster, so those auditory cues, like get a good song on that you like, that has a really good beat and go on a walk with that faster beat. See if you can keep the, your steps. Um, I use the wall a lot for open um, movement. So if you're saying to raise arms higher or bigger, you know, do you want the wall behind you to touch so that you're opening like this? Or do you want some targets way up high to reach up and tap? Um, and that'll help give that external motivation to reach up and get that full movement versus, you know, if you just say to reach up, what is that? Are, are you getting the full movement that you're looking for? Hopefully that kind of helps. Those external cues are really A visual helpful. contact, like if you're, like you're talking wide, if you're using your peripheral, if you can see your, your hands, that, that gets you wider if you use your eyes at the same time. Or yeah. if you're reaching out. But some people like they forget to look for that. So if you're if you're standing the and you can hit the wall standing apart, then you've got that tactile piece too, right? That feels you get to that point. You know that you're there. Same with like a theraband. If you're doing strength, if you pull it all the way taut, versus yeah. if you let it stay loose, those cues will help you know if you're doing that full movement or not. We, we used to call it, uh, when I was coaching for hockey, that if you didn't move properly, if you didn't have a progression, then this would act as an anchor and you'd get in the road of the moving. If you moved, your, you know, if you didn't follow the progression, the, 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 if you tried to move part three first, the other parts just resisted it. So you had to follow the progression to be able to move fluidly. Love a good hockey reference, Ian. Awesome. Um, I see... Um, Sorry, oh, I, did. I was going to say, friend. go ahead, Kathy. I see a question from Harry about um, asking what is a good book that you recommend that talks about gait retraining on the move big mantra uh, is the approach to minimizing basal ganglia movement encoding lookup mechanisms. And he said, awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, um, I don't have one off the top of my head. Let me think about it. Um, I mean, I know that if you're thinking about the move big mantra, I know that the uh, power for life model, Becky Farley's website does have a power uh, book that, that talks about her, the movement principles under the power model, the Parkinson's wellness recovery model. Um, and I, I think she still has that link there. And it's a really easy to read evidence-based book. So I, I'm not sure if it's, I think it will maybe address that. That's the first thing I can think of, but let me think a little bit more and see if I can remember to get, and I'll get back to Monique and Todd if I come up with something, Harry. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. And, and one more plug for what our, uh, Todd said. So the one hour that Stephanie spent with me with her class, uh, uh, looking at me as a CPL patient, uh, the correction that she did for my uh, walk with the with the toes pointed up, mm -hmm. phenomenal. It just took one hour for a correction and I'm I'm reaping the benefits a month later, a month, month and a half later. So if, if we can have a regular PD session, what it can do. So thank you. Oh, Harry, thanks so much for that plug. That I'm so glad that worked out that, that day for you with the it staff and the, and the students. And it was less than 45 minutes of assessment, so thank you. And the lab, the community uh, participation lab. That's right. Yes. And it sounds like you recommend it for those who are on the call. I stumbled upon the CPR. <laughs> 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 yes, definitely. Most definitely. Um, That's great. Thank you. And um, we have a couple other questions that have come in around referrals. Um, it does Kaiser have PT for PD and spine injury? I think you you said that they do because you worked there previously is that right yes i mean they're um the physical therapists are generalist and neuro specific um pts so they should be able to address both okay and then another question related is where do we find a pt for parkinson's and what should the doctor write on the prescription so um there 
all over the place. Um, but I, it depends on what uh, system you're in. So, you know, Kaiser's it's, you know, the, there's, uh, excuse me, neuroclinical specialists at most sites um, in um, the other systems, like Sutter, I believe, I know a lot of clinicians that are neurospecialists as well. In terms of more referrals to private practices, um, you can look up, uh, I think, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link, Monique, when I have a minute to like, make sure I find the right one. But, mm -hmm. um, but there's, uh, there is a link where you can find the neurologic clinical specialists in the area. So if you're specifically looking for that, um, your neurologist or movement disorder specialist most likely should know um, and have a recommendation of a site. They should have relationships with PTs. Um, if not, and you're kind of looking around, I'm always happy to try to make some recommendations with folks I do know in the area um, once you do get the referral. And the referral would say something, um, it could even just say fall prevention. Mm -hmm. That's a nice, easy rec, rec, you know, and, um, and I would say mm -hmm. fall prevention for a person with Parkinson's, um, or Parkinson's, um, you know, if there's something specific you're needing support with, with, you know, is it your gait? Is it a specific mobility issue? Um, you know, you can just let your physician know and they can put that on there, but sometimes our referrals just say Parkinson's disease, to be honest. So yeah. just, that's what it says. Preferred for Parkinson's. That makes you sense. figure it. Yeah. You figure it out, PT. <laughs> um, there's a lot of questions asking about the presentation, um, and just to remind everybody, we are recording, and we will post the recording on our YouTube channel um, in the next day or so, and we will also send out the slides to everybody who registered for the, the um, today's session. So you will get a copy of the slides. So don't and the work table. And the table and the Word document. Exactly. In the log, the exercise log. Um, here's an interesting question from Jane King. Um, is there a therapy for facial masking? Ooh, Ooh I love that question. Um, so uh, LSVT big, so Lee Silverman voice therapy. Um, when you do voice therapy, there's usually a really huge effect on facial masking. Um, so it, you know, and I don't know, I know that some of our speech therapists in Kaiser um, do a modified version of the voice therapy, but, um, you know, your physical therapist oftentimes will add in voice um, with our exercise classes, or if you're going to any exercise classes, like power classes, um, and they, they add any voice, you know, just think about that big movement, big expression, think, think loud, speak loud, move big. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a crossover with speech and PT, um, that can often help work on that, but, um, but it's still the similar concepts of thinking loud and moving big, even when it comes to your face. Uh, mm -hmm. so I'm usually, uh, really expressive. And I change my voice modulation when I'm working with folks um, in hopes that they're going to mirror me a little bit um, when we're, when we're talking. So um, I don't know of anyone specifically, but I can say that there is a, a, there is a crossover depending on the focus. And if you bring that up to your PT, um, they can at least start to work on that or make appropriate referral. I heard once somebody said, read a novel like you wouldn't read a children's book. It was a dark and stormy night. Yep. <laughs> it's all about that task-specific practice, you know, practicing in that way that feels big and uncomfortable and like a little bit goofy and silly to you because um, that's probably going to look more normal um, than the mask case. Yeah, we, we actually have a voice class here at PD Active called Tremolos. And Tremolos hey. is now online. And so people can sing as loud as they'd like because half the time I think they're on mute and the other half the time they sing together. So I think it's a good way to practice the voice modulation and things like that. Oh, I love that so much. Can I ask okay. a question? And yes, what about does, does anyone have an opinion about this book, The Brain's Way of Healing by Norman Doidge? Oh, I love that book. I read that book. What's it called again? The brain's way of healing. 
it's it's <clears throat> it's basically the um uh the history of neuroplasticity and um brain change so is that pertinent to the power of self talk um, always looking for the good so it's a pertinent it's a book that makes sense and goes along with what we're talking about today i think so yep neuroplasticity yeah. and making those uh, changes and connections in their brain. Um, they found in the research that people with Parkinson's, even though you can't change that you have the disease, you can improve your connections and you can still move better. Um, you can change the way you move. So um, that absolutely supports it and, and brings in that understanding of neuroplasticity and brain change. Thank you. Is that, is that related to, I mean, you know, in terms of the evidence base, I know there's there's papers that say that Tai Chi is a good form of exercise for Parkinson, mm -hmm. and then boxing is. Could you just talk a little bit about like what is this what what is the specific reason why yeah, so, those exercises are better? So so Tai Chi is it brings a lot of frontal mechanisms involved because it's really you know you have to really focus on your movement, right? You're thinking about I'm stepping, I'm weight shifting, I'm leaning. I'm reaching, how far am I reaching? I am pulling back. So it, think of it as, as like mindfulness. So mindfulness practice and more that frontal cortical control um, versus um, when you're doing more automatic movements, you're not really thinking and focusing on the movement. So so there's that's why you kind of move a little bit more slowly um, because of the basal ganglia being involved. So, we're, so the Tai Chi is kind of bypassing um, but the basal ganglia by moving into that frontal um, cortical mechanism to like help with that control. So it's that focused attention. So if you think of when you're focused and you're attending, and you may even think of this like, oh yeah, I only trip when I'm not paying attention and I'm not thinking about my movement, or I only catch my foot when I'm not thinking about lifting my foot up. It's that similar. Um, it's it's that focused attention, and then boxing. Um, is think high amplitude, you know, large amplitude, um, high effort, that high effort moving faster, bigger, harder than you, your preferred movement. So always think about um, movement in general for people with Parkinson's is best if you're moving beyond what you prefer to do. So moving in a way that feels a little uncomfortable, a little bigger is where you want to be. And one last question about another specific exercise. That was great. Thank you for that for that answer. What about Pilates and yoga? So um, I the evidence isn't super supportive um, yet, but I think um, Pilates yoga it's going to give you core stability, and yoga in particular is excellent because of the rotational aspect and and flexibility. And also for balance and that vestibular balance system integration in particular. So when I talk about moving your head, you know, you're like twisted, you're looking up, you're on a mat, um, even with chair yoga, you're getting rotation and twisting. So that's all, in my opinion, helping with your vestibular balance system, your um, stiffness and rigidity uh, that might be contributing to that. Um, as well as uh, just pulling in some of that balance system integration of changing how you're using vision or not vision because you close your eyes, move your head. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Someone asked what I know we at seven o'clock. We're going to wrap up. Someone asked about the name of the book again on neuroplasticity. And I think it's the brain's way of healing. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so by Norman Doidge, MD. Say again, by right. whom? Norman Doidge. MD. I spell it right. I always forget how to spell it. D O I D G E. Ah, I missed the D. <laughs> D O I D G E. Oh, That's Lord. great. And he advocates a lot of big movements too, and a lot of walking, a lot of big steps. It was a good book. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that resource. Um, if anybody else has any resources that they'd like to share um to contribute we can add them on to the to the um, email that we're going to send out um after the talk today so please feel free to share i know someone also recommended in the chat some of the classes that stanford has um sounds like those are highly recommended so we'll be ensured to, um, to include those and definitely if you're interested check out the um, community participant lab classes in the fall right angela the next so session would be in the fall 
So the community participant lab with me, which is individualized sessions, that'll be in the spring. The group um, exercise classes specific for Parkinson's, I think they're going to have those in the fall. And um, my last slide um, has the information on who to contact for those. So Jose okay. Reyna, um, Dr. Reyna runs those um, group classes. And then um, Dr. Chrissy Waller and I um, manage the CPL in the fall. And which of those are virtual versus in person? They're all in person. And I, I I can't speak to the group classes if they offer it also virtually. They may do a combo. And do you but, see patients? Um, are you are you available for consultations? Or are I'm you not teaching? practicing right now. I'm full in academia. I um transitioned to full time academia um uh right when the pandemic hit. Um yeah. I was uh, I was functioning more of a per diem role at that time with Kaiser, and they were like, "Well, we can't have any of our per diems right now." And so I was like, "Well, I guess I am doing this then." <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but That's I cool. do I do work with the students um, and partner with them when we have our CPL. So. Yeah, you're training the next generation to take care of us. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. It's 7.03. We wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Have a nice evening. And thank you again, um, everybody for showing up on this Tuesday evening. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you everybody. everybody. Thank really you. appreciate Bye. it. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.